Hi, I'm Ernie Conover. Welcome to my shop. In this first of a new series I'm doing for Woodworkers Journal about hand tools, I'd like to talk about the old tool. They've been around since about 1750 when they first evolved, but that's back saws. I find them to be very handy, so handy in fact, that right on the corner of my bench there, I have two pegs in which four back saws hang so that I can grab them anytime I need them. Back saws come in a variety of sizes and are intended for different purposes. At the top here we see the smallest of all back saws, often called a gent saw. Gent saws are distinguished from other types in that the handle is a simple file type can't handle and they are usually around eight inches long sometimes even shorter and they're perfect for small fine dovetail work such as in this chest this is also a gent saw but is actually bigger than a small handled saw it is a two cherries brand and is a very nice saw it cuts very nice right out of the box this is an independence back saw that I've had for years. It is a 15 point rip filing and most back saws are filed rip. Rip means that they're filed to cut with the grain. These are both rip filings. But here is a slightly bigger independence saw that's a little coarser it's a 14 point but it's a cross cut filing and would be better for cutting across the grain right here when I started woodworking in the 1970s finding good back saws anymore was hard they were on the decline for electric tools you had to get decent ones from England for no one was offering good ones in this country, so many of us turned to the antique market. This is a Atkins built in Indianapolis. They were probably the premier U.S. saw builder, and it was made about 1890. It's a 12 inch in length with a 14 tooth per inch filed rip. Bigger saws than this are up in the 14 to 16 inch range and, and thicker this way. And they're called carcass saws and people are again using them. There are several makers. There's some boutique makers in this country. And they're used as the name connotes for cutting parts in large furniture frames or carcasses. A still bigger saw is a tenon saw, and I've had this one for years. It really was first intended for use in an old time miter box before there were chop saws. And these would run in a frame in the miter box and cut perfect miters. They were also saws this size are used for cutting the cheeks of very large tenons. Starting with our little gent saws, as I mentioned, they are often used for fine dovetails. These aren't all that fine, but this would work fine for dovetails of this size. To start a saw, I usually put my thumbnail against the blade like that and start on the back corner. And you want to lock your wrist. It does not want to do this. You aim it straight down, and all the action here is in my upper arm and elbow. So this looks like a power hacksaw cutting right down through there. I'm watching my gauge line to get the right depth.
There I've touched this gauge line. I've touched that gauge line. The two cherries would work about the same way. Again, my thumbnail is against that, but not touching the teeth of the saw. Going to start right there. That is a very nice saw. But a lot of people prefer a handled back saw. There's two kinds of handles. There's open handles and there's closed handles. Older saws had handles which were very ergonomic. That one's made of apple wood. This one's made of curly maple. This was probably the first U.S. company to start making really good back saws. Again, there's now eight or ten of them in the United States and Canada. But you can see this fits my hand and a, a craftsman refers to it hangs well. That it just fits your hand and it's intuitive how it it moves in your hand and how it hangs as the name implies. Again, I can go right in here. I find that pointing my finger in the direction of the cut and laying it beside the, the, the handle and the rest of my fingers are down here wrapped around it, I get a straighter, better cut. Many will find it hard to start a back saw for, at first and a little trick you can do until you get better at it is go in and cut the corner of that with a chisel and then make a second cut right there. And this gives me some place to rest my saw against as I cut. And this big 12 inch Atkins at 14 points is still a favorite of mine. So that is how you handle a back saw, how you guide it. There's a common thought is to get the finest, thinnest back saw you can for very fine dovetails. That's good later on, but at first it may actually make you do worse because these are a little bit like a rifle. Once you point that in a direction, after two or three cuts, it's going to go in that direction and you can change it a minute amount, but not much. So until you learn the art of aiming it correctly, getting it started, it is better to have a little more set in the saw, that is the teeth are bend it, bent left and right, so the kerf is wider than the saw body, and quite frankly, a wider saw. I think about 14 points is a good starting saw, right where this Atkins is. Also, whether you file, file them rip or cross cut is subject to endless discussion in woodworking groups. My feeling is at about 14 points, it doesn't make much difference. You can actually make cross cuts with a rip filed saw fairly well at 14 points or finer. Points are the number of teeth lying within one inch. You don't count the spaces, you count the teeth. So it's usually one more than what we think it is. To that end, many craftsmen like Japanese, often called a dezuki saw, and these are also popular because you can just buy a whole new blade that slips right in this handle and so sharpen it with the minimum of effort. They cut a very fine curve and with some practice they're the cat's meow. They also differ in that they cut on the pull stroke and not the push stroke. So.
They cut fast, but they are very much like a rifle. If your aim is off, uh, the bottom of this kerf is not going to be where you intended it to be. But they do cut beautiful. I like western saws because it's what I learned on, but these are inexpensive and very good. A common use of a back saw is to hand cut mortise, the tenon side of mortise and tenon joints. My favorite saw for that would be this big Atkins. And I'm cutting such that the left side of my saw is splitting that line. And I'm cutting what's called the cheek of the tenon. see where if this was a bigger tenon having a big tenon saw would make this work go a lot faster There. Now you generally put some set in on both sides. A shop made fixture, if you will, that should be on everyone's bench is a bench hook. This is a piece of MDF plywood with two strips glued and lightly nailed to this piece. It is made for right-handed people or for left-handed people. You often find old ones like this new one that I have put one to five, one to six, and one to eight triangles on here to set a bevel to lay out dovetails. To cut the cheeks of our tenons, we can do it with several ways. One is with the same saw we cut the cheeks with, and it is rip filed, 14 teeth. I'm starting it right there on that line. I'm just walking it right across, bringing it level. And there we go. I will now turn 90 degrees. do this cheek, but, or this shoulder I should say, but we're going to do it with the 14 point cross cut, which will do a little nicer job. And I'll come up. And you see there isn't a lot of difference here. I've missed my line on this one just teensy. I cut a bit away from it. This one I hit dead on. But this is a job not for a saw, but for a very specialized plane called the shoulder rabbit plane which we'll cover in detail one of these days. But that brings you right up to a beautiful shoulder and we just make the other one match it. And there's a good example of why you should cut to your line and not proud of it. 
but we now have a good tenon there. A back saw is also good for making dados in small or even large pieces of furniture. This is where the so-called carcass saw, which would be quite a bit bigger than this, comes in. But I can show it with this little crosscut saw on this narrow piece of wood. If I wanted to cut a dado across here, I would simply take this cross, and this is where crosscut filing is better. And I'm just walking it right down along that gauge line I struck. And I'll go to this side. And I'll waste all of this material with a chisel. This is, can also be done with what's called a router plane. Does it a little handier and gets to a very specific depth. But it's a very quick way to cut a dado. I'd have it done while you were still trying to figure out where to set the fence on your table saw. A final use of a back saw is with a shop built miter box. Very simple tool. I took a piece of a approximately one inch thick wood here, even a little better than that. And I glued two more blocks to it that are parallel. You just put something that's parallel in here and glue them in that way. And then I laid out 90 degrees, 45 degrees, 45 degrees. And to cut something nice and square, I can just put it right in here, take this little saw and And again, this is where the crosscut saw is a little better. There we go. And you see this cut it both square this way and square this way. You can also cut miter joints with this by simply putting this in there like that. And then you would put the saw down like that and cut a perfect 45. Any saw eventually gets dull. And that's what's attractive about Japanese back saws is that you can just slip another blade right in there. It is very hard to find a competent service to sharpen up any hand saw these days. So I really think you have to do it yourself. The following is a about 15 minute piece of video that I made in 2005 as part of a series on sharpening I did. It was shot in standard definition and there's a much younger me. But it pretty well shows the mechanics, albeit on a big carpenter's hand saw and not a back saw. Uh, you just have to uh, think smaller. The mechanics are identical and you use smaller files. Also, also for filing any saw, but especially back saws, a pair of loops where you can see well for that is quite helpful. So without further ado, let's take a look at this. Here is an extremely specialized file, and it's a, a Japanese uh, saw file and can be purchased from people like Japan Woodworker on the West Coast. These are all triangular files, and they're for uh, sharpening Western-style files. And uh, the size, uh, this would be for a very fine, uh, uh, say a 14-pitch uh, uh, back saw, where uh, this large triangular file would be more for like a, a five-point rip saw.
A truly sharp hand saw is a joy to use. Unfortunately, many saws come from the store today improperly sharpened. What's more, it's hard to find a service that will do the job properly for you. I really feel to get a saw that performs to your liking, you have to sharpen it yourself. You need a few tools to sharpen saws. Uh, one is a saw vise, which you can find at flea markets and garage sales yet. Uh, also, tool dealers sell them fairly readily. The going price is between $40 and $80. Also, there are directions in Tay Free. Tay Free teaches woodworking to build a, a saw vise yourself. It can easily be fabricated out of wood. You'll also need a set, and the set is put on the saw like so, and it bends the teeth alternately one way or the other, and creates what is called the set of the saw, and that allows the teeth to cut a wider curve than the body of the saw. You'll need a variety of triangular files, uh, and they uh, are for the actual sharpening of the teeth, and they're readily available at most hardware stores. Finally, you need a saw jointer, and this device is put over the body of the saw like so, and brings the teeth to a common height. If you don't have this tool and can't find one antique, and they're a bit of a hassle to find these days, you can simply take and put a file on a piece of wood like so and use that to sharpen or to joint the saw and bring the teeth to a common length. Finally, uh, a nice powerful pair of glasses is nice to be able to see what you're doing, especially on finer saws. Uh, this is a set of glasses I bought from Orbis that are three uh, power and uh, they're designed for tying flies on for fly fishermen, but they work great for filing saws. The first thing I do uh, when I'm sharpening, uh, starting to sharpen a saw is I paint each tooth with blue layout fluid. Layout fluid is available from industrial hardware suppliers, and it's for making layout lines on metal when you're going to cut it. Once I've painted all the teeth, I can quickly tell which teeth I've filed and which I need to file yet. Before we can effectively set the saw, we need to find out how many teeth it has per inch. And we actually count the teeth within one inch. So we start at one, two, three, four, five. This is about five and a half or six pitch. So we will now set our saw set to that pitch. And what that's done is move this little anvil up or down so that the base of the anvil is at the base of the tooth and it's going to bend the entire triangle over at the base. We now, starting at the tip, simply come in here and bend every other tooth away from us like so. Once we've done every other tooth, we'll come to this side and do the teeth in between, the ones we just bent, and bend them, of course, the other way. Good firm squeeze on the set, trying to be even every time you do it, the same amount of pressure. And so on, we'll work our way all the way up to the other end of the saw. Once the saw is set, we now take the jointing tool and we simply put it down over the saw like this. Or the length of the saw, and we look, and when we've touched the top of every tooth, we know there. I've just touched the top of every tooth, and now I know that I have a level playing field there.
Next, we pick a file which is of the correct size for the teeth we want to file, and we put a good handle on it. The handle makes the job safer, and it does the job better. We now simply put this file down in the teeth like so, and it gets rolled about 15 or 20 degrees towards the nose of the saw. So not level, it's about 15 degrees rolled like so. And this, of course, is a rip saw, so we will file every tooth straight across, like so. And we want to do the same number of strokes on each tooth. Notice that I'm filing straight across, same number of strokes, and doing enough strokes to bring it to a sharp point again. If you can't get every tooth to come to a sharp point, don't try to file more or less. File the same number of strokes all the way down through the saw, and then come back, re-blue it, and start over again doing the same number of strokes until you get every tooth to come sharp. And this way, you will keep the height of all the teeth the same. Now the filing of a, a, a crosscut saw varies from uh, a rip saw and that we did everything we did previously on the rip. We set the teeth, we glued it, and we jointed it. Uh, but now instead of holding the file rolled forwards and straight across, we're now going to hold it at about a 65 degree angle, rolled forward slightly, and we'll take three strokes like that, or four strokes, whatever it needs and skip a tooth. Once we've filed every other tooth at 65 degrees in this direction, we go to the intermediate teeth between the teeth we've just filed, turn the file 65 degrees in this direction, and again rolling it 15 degrees towards the nose, we'll file the intermediate teeth. We proceed that way to the heel of the saw at which point we're done. It is quite possible to sharpen Japanese saws as well. And of course, as we mentioned at the beginning of this segment, that you need a special Japanese uh, saw set, which is much finer. And we set the anvil to the base of the tooth. And we bend every other tooth in one direction and the alternate teeth in the other direction. We then need to get a special Japanese saw file, which has a much different shape from its western cousin. You can get these files from people like Japan Woodworker on the west coast. And here we'll come in and file every other tooth like so, a much steeper angle, more like 30 degrees. And then we would come around and file the intermediate teeth like so. And of course we can do this from either side of the saw. Well, I hope you like this take on back saws. I hope that you make them part of your workflow because I think you will be rewarded for that effort. Thanks for visiting my shop. <laughs>